Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and welcome to those who are joining us online and who will be viewing this afterwards and watching it then. Um, we're going to talk about something today that we've been touching on with a little bit of salt and pepper, and we're going to delve a little bit deeper into it. Again, still tied back into some of the things that happened on the sixth day, and we're just going to uh, continue down that road until we rip it completely apart, and uh, we're going to show you how it's going to be put, get put back together uh, one day by the Father. Uh, we'll do that another week, but let's go to prayer, and we'll start off with what we're going to be talking about today. Father, we come before you, and we thank you for thanksgiving in our hearts, Father, entering into your courts with praise. Father, let today be the day that we see things in our lives. Let it resonate to the four corners of the earth what's being brought forward, Father, for the building of your kingdom, for the building of our temple within ourselves so that we can get ourselves straightened up, Father. Get closer to you, and that's what the goal is, Father, to walk, Father, to walk into your ways. And in Yeshua's name we pray, amen. So I want to talk a little bit more, because I said I was going to do more teaching into it. And this is not the end of this. This is just another piece of the puzzle on this topic. But we're going to talk about the spirit of Cain. And we're going to get into this a little bit deeper today. But as we go through this thing with the spirit of Cain, we've got to look at the big picture of what, what was really, truly going on. It wasn't just about a brother killing a brother. There's a deeper story and parallels to it all the way through Scripture. So we're going to look at some of those parallels and some of the things that went on. And as we go through it, I want you to look for eight points that I'm going to bring up, and I'm going to save the ninth point. But when we go through the thing with Cain, we see that there's, there's instruction, and then it goes in from instruction, it goes to the obedient or to the righteous. And then you'll see it go through to the third point, into disobedience. And then you'll see the fourth point, envy against the obedient. And then you'll see into the fifth point, to being filled with hatred. To the sixth point, evil deeds. And those evil deeds will lead to the seventh point, which is to murder. And to the eighth, to shedding of innocent blood. And then the ninth point, like I said, we're not there yet. The ninth point hasn't come full circle yet. And that happens at the end of the sermon. I'll talk about that. Did everybody get those points written down? Want me to go through them real quick again? Instruction. Number one was instruction. Number two, it's instruction to the obedient or the righteous. Number three leads into disobedience, being what? My way. I'm going to do it my way. The fourth one, to envy against the obedient. The fifth, to be filled with hatred, leads what? To the sixth point, evil deeds, which leads to murder, which leads to the shedding of innocent blood. If you want those and you need them, send me an email. I can copy them because I'm going to have a few more lists that you might not get. But in Genesis 1.24, and you're, oh, here we go back to that. Yeah, some of this is going to be repetitive because, like I said, it has been some salt and pepper over, over the last few weeks or the last month or so with some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. But God said, let the earth bring forth each kind of living creature, each kind of living uh, livestock, crawling animal, and wild beast, and that's how it was. God made each kind of wild beast, each kind of livestock, and every kind of animal that crawls along the ground, and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1.26, Then God said, Let us make humankind in, in our image, in the likeness of ourselves, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the air, the animals in all over the earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the earth. So God created humankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful. These are key points. We're going to talk a little bit about this today. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. We're going to look exactly at what some of that was. We'll teach into that another into depth later on. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and every living creature that crawls on the earth. You see, we see what we go through the thing with Cain and Abel. And we know that Cain was a tiller of the ground. 
We know that Abel was uh, raising sheep, the livestock. We see Abel having and executing dominion over the things that we were commanded to have dominion over. Nowhere were we given dominion over the plants of the earth. And that's what Cain was into. He was trying to get into the, the tilling of the ground. So be it. But it's nothing to do with what dominion that we had been given to take over. You see, that dominion, when it comes to the things of the ground and the, and the ground producing for us, that falls back into the Father's vine process. That comes from you being obedient. You go to Deuteronomy 28, and it talks about that in there. It comes from your obedience. It comes from the things of, of Scripture. You know, if you want rain in due season so that it can affect the things that are in the ground, that comes down to you individually and your walk individually and your obedience back unto God's Word. You see, we were given dominion only over the living things. But then again, we got into the thing with, with Cain and Abel, and Cain got into the, I want to do it my way. I think they wrote a song about, about that one at one point in time. He wanted to do it his way. So let's go to Genesis 4.1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. You see, Abel, the righteous, Abel, the righteous, here he is taking care of the commandments of God, taking care of the thing that God gave man dominion over, over the earth, over all of the earth, to keep, to shepherd them. See again, Cain was not ruling over these things. Cain was not taking care of these things. And there's nothing wrong with what he was doing at that point in time. But he tried to use that as a sacrifice because, hey, I want to do it my way. Genesis, uh, Genesis 4.3 And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offerings. Now we're going to jump down. You're going to have to go back and fill in a few verses there. But it comes down to right there, it comes down to the, the blood. It always has come down to blood. It always took blood. And that's why God honored what was going on there with Abel. He was doing it God's way. He was doing with what God was trying to plant in the earth for the future. See, it couldn't just grow from the ground, take that, sacrifice that to God. That wasn't acceptable to him. And because of all this, we get, what? Cain killing his brother. So let's jump down to Genesis 4.9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he lied. And he said, I don't know. He knew where he was. He knew that he had slayed him. Am I my brother's keeper? Doesn't that sound just like a typical snot-nosed kid? Doesn't it sound like somebody who sometimes we get into these things, I want to do it my way? We see little kids that, no, no, I want to do it my way. I don't want to do that. And that's exactly what it, what's going on here. you got a grown man acting like a child. But we all have been caught doing that, haven't we? I want to do it my way. Genesis 4.11 And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened up her mouth to receive thy brother's blood, thy brother's blood from thy hand. And that there is heavy, heavy duty stuff. Now you have to look back and you have to put yourself in that predicament and the position that they were in. You know the animosity and the things that rose up within, within Cain. Do you think it's possible that he got angry? He got angry at his brother because his, his, it was, his offering was acceptable? Obviously, he got angry towards God. Do you think it's possible that he just looked at God and said, oh yeah, you want blood? I'll give you blood. And he slaughtered his brother. You see, these are the things that we're looking at because you see the slaughtering of the brother, the murdering of the brother, all the way through Scripture, whether it be through hatred, whether it be through murmuring, whether it be through gossip. We see spiritual murdering. We see physical murder. We see hatred. We see people who have pretended that their brother was murdered, brought the cloak to the father as in Joseph. But we see this murdering of the brotherhood, the brotherhood, the brotherhood, all the way through Scripture, and it's the Cain spirit continuing on. 
You see, but again, it always took flesh, and it always has taken flesh for purity, for purity and to satisfy the things that God need. You see, Cain, obviously the first son, he turned evil. He turned evil. Abel, the second son, righteous, righteous. And we're going to look at those two parallels right there as to first son and second son. We're going to look at the second coming. We're going to look at the second Adam. And we're going to run parallels with a lot of this stuff. Because it sounds like Adam into Yeshua with Cain and Abel, the brother themselves. Because Adam did things what? He went and did things his way. He screwed it up. He brought sin in. But then we have the murder. We have the murder. And if we go back and you read, like I said, I didn't read it. I didn't read it on purpose because I want you to go back and do your own homework. It's broke down into four points, or, or sorry, six points, seven points of what exactly went on within that. Because it was like a trial that Cain had to go through. Because in Genesis 4.9, well, let's start off in 4.8. We got the proceedings that go against him. The way that God approached him. The way that God went through this whole thing. We've got his arraignment. And that's in 4.9, the first part. And then we've got his plea. Genesis 4.9, the last part of that verse. The third one, we've got his conviction. The fourth one, we've got the sentence that's passed down upon him. And then the fifth point. The fifth point, we've got his complaint against the sentence. The sixth point, we've got the ratification of the sentence. And the seventh point, we've got the execution of the sentence. And this is what Cain went through. But again, remember, Abel and Cain were both sons of the first man. The first man. You see, Yeshua went through the exact same process that Cain had to go through here. Because he had to go through an arraignment. What was Yeshua's arraignment? He was brought before Pilate. The second point, his plea, he said nothing. He didn't give a plea. He got in front of Pilate and said nothing. And Pilate saw him as innocent in him saying absolutely nothing. He couldn't find anything wrong with what the man had done. And then we get the third one, his conviction. The conviction of Jesus Christ. You see, brother Judah took the blood took the innocent blood, and they took that innocent blood upon themselves. They said it. We'll take the blood. Put it upon us and our children. Dangerous thing to say? Absolutely it's a dangerous thing. And then they got the sentence that was passed upon him, which was what? His death. And then his complaint against the, his, his sentence? You remember, he knew that what was going to happen to him. And he stood there in the garden. And he constantly was going back at the Father, let this cup pass, let this cup pass, unless it be thy will, Father. Unless it be thy will. Not my will, but your will. Cain and Abel, you see the difference? He was righteous. And he kept going back to the Father, pleading, hey, Father, let it pass. Let it pass. To the point he was sweating blood. But it was not my way. If it's your will, Father, let it be your way. And then again, we see the ratification of the sentence. The ratification of the sentence. Matthew 26, 63. I'm going to give some verses now. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I call you to swear a binding oath by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have in fact said it. But more than I tell you, regardless of what you do with me now, in the future you will see my re me revealed as the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes, we're going to jump back to this again later, tore his robes in mock honor, or in mock horror, and exclaimed, He has blasphemed by making himself God's equal. What further need have we of witness or evidence? See, you have now heard the blasphemy. The blasphemy. 
And the seventh point there that I brought up with what Cain went through, the execution of the sentence. We're going to come back to the execution of the sentence again later because right after the execution of the sentence, and the one point I haven't brought up too much about yet, the remorse. The eighth point, remorse. Remorse has not come. Remorse has not happened for the blood that was shed from Cain to Abel, from Jewish, our Jewish brothers to the Messiah Himself. John 3.12 John 3.12 through 14 And be not like Cain who took his, na- took his na- uh, nature and got his motivation from the evil one and slew his brother. And why did he slay him? Because his deeds, his activities, his works were wicked and malice and his brother were righteous, virtuous. We have malice and we have virtue here. Malice and virtue. Don't be surprised and wonder, brethren, that the world detests and pursues you with hatred. Who's he talking about here? The world? The world is going to pursue us, Ephraim. The world is going to hate us. They are going to come at us with this malice, a malicious spirit, a Cain spirit. It's out there and it's alive and it's not just going to come from the world. It's going to come from the church. It's going to come from anybody out there, any entity out there who wants to do things their way or who does not understand, who does not understand even Brother Judah will come because we will drive them what to jealousy. What do you think they're going to do when they get jealous? Envy. What happened with Cain and Abel when that happened? They got abs- he got absolutely irate. And they will do it once again. But there's a solution at the end, so says the Scripture. So says the Scripture. Isaiah 58, 1. I've got quite a bit of Scripture today. Sorry, don't jump there. I'm just going to read the Isaiah 58, 1, and then we're going to jump over to 59, 1. You see, 58.1 is going to tell us who 59.1 was written to. Isaiah 58.1, Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgressions and to the house of Jacob their sins. So let's jump over to 59.1 as he goes through his spiel. Behold, the Lord's hand is not, is not shortened at all. They cannot save nor hear or nor his ear dull with deafness, it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. None sues or calls in righteousness, but for the sake of doing injury to others to take some undue advantage. No one goes to law honestly and pleads his case in truth. They trust in emptiness, worthlessness, futility, and speaking lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth evil. You see, you look at that stuff and there's a lot of stuff in there, even about innocency and righteousness, and that's what the premises of what went on there was the attack on righteousness, the attack on what God is trying to do this day and this hour. You see it throughout the course of transition over time. Every time God has transitioned, there has been an absolute attack on that transition because people didn't understand And it's happening, and it's going to happen, and it's going to grow until the understanding comes. But that's where we come in. We've got to bring the understanding to them. And that's why you've got to know the material. That's why you've got to know these things that we're talking about. Jeremiah 26, 15, we have one verse here. But know for certain that if you do put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves. Now we're going to look here, and I want you to take a a key point here on what does innocent blood affect from what he's going to say here. You will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city, upon its inhabitants, upon yourself, 
For in truth, the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your ear. The innocent blood, the innocent blood that gets shed, and hope to God we're not still shedding it through murdering, through words and all those other things. Innocent blood will affect people. It will affect you. It'll affect the area that you live in. It'll affect your home. It'll affect the citizens of the town. It'll affect the citizens of a country. It'll affect the citizens of a nation. And that's why it's got to be dealt with. It always has to be dealt with. John 1, 3, verse 11 through 15. For this message, the announcement which you have heard from the first, that we should love one another and not be like Cain, who took his nature and got his motivation from the evil one and slew his brother. And why did he slay him? Because his deeds were wicked, his malice righteous. Don't be surprised and wonder, brother, wonder brethren, that the world detests and pursues, pursues you with hatred. You see, we jump back at Scripture there, and be not like Cain, who took his nature and got his motivation from the evil one and slew his brother. And why did he slam? Because his deeds, his activities, his works were wicked and malice, and his brothers were righteous. And what's righteousness mean there? Virtue. Virtue. Now, if you look at Proverbs 31, it gives a good idea of what a virtuous woman is. A virtuous woman and what they're supposed to do. And that wasn't from Samuel. That was from Lamuel, King Lamuel. And that was from his mother who was teaching him. That's what a virtuous woman was and still is to this day. But that's how we've got to look at ourselves as the bride of the Messiah to be virtue unto Him. All of us. We've got to look at these things and remain holy, remain clean, remain pure. And this isn't about the Jezebel thing. We'll get to that again in a little bit here. But you can see the Cain spirit within the Jezebel thing as well. You can see the Baal spirit, the Cain spirit. You can see it all tied together. You can see it all come from the same swamp. You dump it all in the pot, you take the ladle, and you take a scoop out, and it's all in there. We had chili last week. You take a scoop out, you can see the hamburger in there. You can see the mushrooms, you can see the pepper, you can see everything in there. But it's all in the same pot. Same thing with darkness. You see, but when we go through this, let me read the, finish that. John 3, 14. I know we have passed over, or... Uh, passed over out of death into life. But the fact that we love the brethren, our fellow Christians, he who does not love abides, remains, is held, and kept, continu kept continually in spiritual death. In spiritual death. Anyone who hates his brother or detests his brother in Christ is a murderer. And did you know that no murder has eternal life abiding and persevering within him? You see, Cain's road led him to murder. But murder was not the road itself. You see, it all started back with that process that we opened up with. It started off with God gave some type of an instruction. And it went down the path, and it went down, and I think it was about number four, we got into envy. And I did a whole teaching at a conference on envy and emulation. But that spirit works within the Cain Spirit. And we just have to look at what's going on in the world around us today and, and, and how things are absolutely crazy because everybody just wants everything that somebody else has without having to do the work for it. They don't want to do any sacrifice, but they want the reward. You see, sacrifice comes with a reward. Sacrifice comes with a reward. If you sacrifice your time unto the Father to study, you will get the reward because you can get closer to the things of the Father. It's not just stealing what somebody else has worked for. You've got to put in your time. And that's why we are up here. And that's why you do what you do. It's about perfecting, about maturing the things of God within our lives and being a doer of the Word, not just a hearer. And because of that, we will be envied. We will be envied. We will have that Cain spirit rise up towards us and people will hate us and they will want to kill us. There's some out there that already do. You see, but the hearers out there, the people who are lazy, the ones that want to be out there and just judge everything and look and point a finger and well that, they're not doing their due diligence. They're lazy. 
They're lazy. And then they'll turn envious because of your success, because of your power in the things and touching into the things of the Father and the power that He's got and you being plugged into His power on the face of this earth, it will drive people absolutely wild. And that's why Brother Judah is absolutely going to go crazy, it says in Scripture. We're going to drive them to jealousy. What happens when they get jealous? We see the examples of what happens to God's people when they get jealous over over time. It gets up to the point where they want to slay you and eliminate the problem, cut you off. But the greater works, what are they doing? What are we going to be touching into? It's emulating Jesus Christ Himself on the face of the earth. So how are we going to drive them crazy? Where in Scripture have we seen where other people have been driven crazy? Well, we can see it with Cain and Abel. I've got about 11 points here. We can see it with uh, Jacob fled from the face of his brother Esau. We can see Joseph. Joseph being persecuted even unto death. We can see Joseph, his brothers. They were so enraged with Joseph. That's a key point there, though. What about Moses? Moses... He fled from Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And what happened there? It was all because of what? Who made thee a judge and a ruler over us? Envy. Wilt thou kill me as thou did that Egyptian? There it is. We see Aaron and Miriam shut out of the camp. David. David, he wasn't just hated by strangers. He was persecuted. Looked at by even what? King Saul himself. King Saul himself. Got the apostles. Well, let's not forget Jesus, obviously. Handed over to his death because of all this stuff. You got the apostles. Peter underwent what? Many beatings, sufferings, thrown in jail, hated. All because of what? What was bestowed upon him for the destiny within his life. We see Paul, Paul beaten, again, jailed, whipped. We see this constantly going on, this spirit rising up, brother to brother. Remember, we are still at this point in time, we're talking about children of the Almighty God. The world out there did not care about Jesus Christ. It was people who cared about the things of the Father who didn't understand that did the worst to each other. That's where it happened. And we've got people who have, through Scripture, even in today's world, you can see where envies, things like this, spirit again comes in, and it will absolutely even separate, separate your mind from your flesh, your mind from your spirit, your mind from your, your spirit from your flesh, your spirit from your mind and segregate those things, and then you have an internal fight within yourself. An internal fight within yourself. It comes down to a few things with this. Envy, strife. They've got to be overturned. They've got to be overturned. The the Cain spirit has got to be overturned. So when will that happen? We'll get to that in a little bit here. You see, but darkness has always tried to segregate Darkness has always tried to separate the righteous. And then once he tries to separate, once he gets the righteous separate, separated, he's always run a full-bore attack upon them. He's always done it. Because they are the ones, we are the ones, you are the ones that this has an effect on the kingdom of darkness. You're stealing his people and bringing them back into the camp of the Father bringing them back into righteousness, and darkness is not going to allow that to happen without a fight. It's how he goes about the fight. Obadiah 1.10. Let's look at this a little bit more. The fight, the fight, the fight, the violence. Obadiah 1.10. For the violence you did against your brother Jacob, this is talking about Edom's violence against Jacob. For the violence you did against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof from your brother Jacob, on the day that the strangers took captive his forces and carried off his wealth, the day that the strangers uh, and foreigners and entered in, into his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were even as one of them. 
But you should have not gloated over your brother's day, the day when his misfortune came and he was made a stranger. You should not have rejoiced over the sons of Judah in the day of their ruin. You should not have spoken arrogantly in the day of their distresses. You should have not entered the gates of my people in the day of their calamity and ruin. Yes, you should have not looked with delight on their misery in the day of their calamity and ruin and have reached after their army and their possessions in the day of their calamity and ruin. And you should not have, st- have stood at the crosswalk, crossway to cut off those of Judah who escaped. Neither should you have delivered up those of Judah who remained in the day of distress. The day of distress. You see, all the enemies of righteousness, of the messianic community of which we are, for all those who walk in the, in the way of Cain that hated Abel, so too all those walk in the way of Esau who hated Jacob. Listen to this one, though. But it was Jacob. It was Jacob by a particular virtue that he had dominion. That he had dominion because he had the blessing. You see, because we got the sin that's charged upon the Edomites here. And then we have the threat of their ruin that should come upon them for that sin because God will be against them. You've got to realize that God will be fighting on your side as long as you are righteous. And it doesn't look like it all the way through Scripture. It didn't look like it with Abel but he needed something planted in the face of the earth for that blood to cry out so that blood could be rectified, which hasn't taken place yet, in the end. In the end. We're going to get there in a second. You see, but Joseph is who we are. One of Jacob's younger sons. Was he his youngest son? No, he's not his youngest son. Benjamin was his youngest son. Jacob, or sorry, Joseph, is the youngest of the ten tribes, though. Remember Benjamin? He went with the other and they stayed over there with Judah. We are the youngest of the brothers. We are the youngest of the brothers. And Joseph himself ruled on the face of the earth. We know that he ruled. We know that he set up storehouses. We know that people came to him with everything before their survival. And they relied on him for everything for their survival, because the anointing that God placed and hit within his life, even though they tried to murder him at one point in time, God still was there. At least they knew enough to stand up and say, hey, don't do it. The brothers knew enough not to shed his innocent blood. They learned a lesson somewhere along the line from what happened with with, uh, Cain and Abel. They looked back on that. You see, but we are going to rule the face of the earth. You have got to see yourself as a ruler over the face of this earth. You've got to rise up. Because what Joseph means, Joseph means to increase. Joseph means to increase. If we go back to Genesis 1.28 now, God blessed them. God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. We are Joseph. We are to do the increase and bring the increase into the kingdom of God. We are to bring the increase back into the Garden of Eden, back into the land which He swore to our fathers, our forefathers. But we've got to take authority. And we take authority through the righteousness that's been placed within our lives, through the sacrifices that was shown and the sacrifice brought forth to the Father by Abel, the sacrifice of Yeshua Himself by partaking into that. By partaking into that and bringing the power because we are plugged in to the the Father's vine system. The Father's vine system that He controls. Now let's look at David. Of course, we're going to touch on that. 1 Samuel 19.4. I've got some passages of Scripture here I just want to rip off. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, for he has not sinned against you, and his deeds have been good for service to you. For he took his life in his hands, and he slew the Philistine, 
and the Lord wrought a great deliverance for all of Israel and saw that thou rejoicest. Why then do you sin against innocent blood and kill David without cause? Wow. This is Jonathan. Saul's son saying, why are you going to kill David? He's innocent. And what happened? Did he kill him? No. Did he try to? Yes. The murder had already taken place in the spirit then. There's a consequence for that for Saul. What about Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh? Let's look at Manasseh in 2 Kings 21.16. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood, filling Jerusalem from one end to the other. Besides his sin, and making Judah sin by doing evil in the sight of the Lord. The rest of the acts of Manasseh and all he did and all his sins that he committed are not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his own house, in the garden of Uzzah. Amon, his son, reigned in his stead. Let's look at another one about innocent blood here. Matthew 27, 24. So when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but rather that a riot was breaking out, he took water and washed his hands to ceremonial cleanse himself of guilt. Why? Because when he did that, let me finish reading the verse. In the presence of the crowd saying, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. See to that yourselves. You see, the Jews know that when you wash your hands, it's a spiritual cleansing. And he was showing them that there was a spiritual cleansing. And he was washing his hands and saying, I am having absolutely no part in this. And they took all of that upon themselves. Now let's look at Acts 18, 4 through 6. We're going to look at Paul in Corinth. And he reasoned and debated in the synagogues every Sabbath, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia... Paul began devoting himself completely to preaching the word and solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. But since the Jews kept resisting and opposing him and blaspheming God, he shook out his robe and said to them, Your blood, your blood, your damnation will be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Your job and your responsibility is to bring the Word of God to people. At that point in time, your hands are clean of their blood. You're not going to sit there and pound it into somebody and pound it into somebody, but as long as they are sitting there and they are willing to receive, as long as they are sitting at the table that's set for them in the wilderness in which we live and willing to partake, you feed them and you feed them and you feed them. And if you do that, then your Father above can do the same thing at the table that you sit with Him. His banquet table. His table that He's prepared for you in the wilderness. You can partake of that, but you've got a responsibility because it always goes back to the one thing. It's always you do and then He can do. You go out there and you feed the people the Word of God and then God can come in and He can feed you all the blessings that are within His Scripture and everything that is written. And He's waiting to do that. He's got the table set. The food's been hot. And He's waiting for His audience. He's waiting for His guests to come. Will you come and sit at His table? Jeremiah 7, verse 3. Here's what Adonai it's about. The God of Israel says, Improve your ways and actions, and I will let you stay in this place. Don't rely on that deceitful slogan, the temple of Adonai, the temple of Adonai. These buildings are the temple of Adonai. No! But if you really improve your ways and actions, if you really administer justice between people, if you stop oppressing foreigners, orphans, and widows, if you stop shedding innocent blood in this place, and if you stop following other gods to your own harm, then I will let you stay in this place, the land that I gave your ancestors forever and ever. You see, it gets bunched in there with the innocent blood with a bunch of other things that we've got to really take a good hard look at and make sure that, make sure that we're fulfilling. If you stop oppressing foreigners, who are the foreigners? The stranger that are outside there. Bring them all in. Come on. They can have a seat and a better seat. 
Go get them. Do your job, Ephraim. If you stop oppressing foreigners, orphans and, and widows, if you stop shedding innocent blood in this place, and if you stop following other gods. How much have we been pounding on about stop following other gods and the things that are out there within the church world, things that are out there within our communities, probably things that are in our homes that we don't even realize have everything to do with sun worship and we don't even realize it? Stop following. Stop, stop, stop. And just do things the way that our Father wants. Why? Because our King on the face of this earth, He wants to rule and He wants to reign within your life. He wants to rule and He wants to reign on this earth and He wants to do it with us because He's going to need us as here as well. And He needs you, but you've got to be walking in His ways in order to be able to walk in the ruling of His ways. Walk in His ways. And that's why we can't just push his ways off to the side and allow the Yetzer Hurrah that spoke of. The evil inclination of man, the evil inclination that was within Cain, the thing that rose up inside of him. We can't allow them to take over. You have got to subdue that spirit within you if that's the way you are. It can't be your way. It's only the Father's way. It's only the Father's way. Genesis 6.5. Genesis 6.5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination and intention of the human thinking was only evil continually. Again, the Yetzer Hurrah. The evil inclination. You see, we are born and you have been given every opportunity you've been given, everything in Scripture to overcome that. You've got everything that you need to overcome it. Every living person on the face of the earth who participates in the things of God has got the armor of God and the weaponry of God to defeat those things within yourself. But that's got to be the first thing that you conquer. You have to conquer that. Let's go to Zechariah 12. 10 through 14, and we're going to wrap up here today with this set of scriptures. We opened up and we talked about the points. And the one thing that hasn't happened yet with Cain, it went all the way through, I'll read it quickly again, the instruction to the obedience, to the righteous, to the disobedience, to the my way, I want it my way or the highway, to the envy, against the obedient. It leads to what? Being filled with hatred. It goes to the evil deeds, to murder, to shedding of innocent blood. And to the full circle, remorse. Remorse for shedding innocent blood, which has not happened. Zechariah 12.10 And I will pour out on the house of David upon those living in Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer, and they will look to me whom they pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They will be in bitterness on his behalf like the bitterness for a firstborn son. When that day comes, there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem. Mourning like that for Hadad, Rimon, and Megiddo Valley. Then the land will mourn each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, their wives by themselves, and the family of the house of Dathan by itself, and their wives by themselves. The family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves. And the family of Shemin by itself and their wives by themselves. All the remaining families, each by itself and their wives by themselves. We will see the remorse, but when the remorse comes to our brothers as the family comes back together, when Judah realizes the button, what they have done, and that remorse comes and they're weeping. Don't look at them and point a finger and say, I told you so because we already read that set of Scriptures. No, your responsibility is to what? To show them. Show them love. Show them love. But that's when the full circle will come. When the whole entire family of God comes back together again. All the twelve tribes. When the two sticks are joined and put in the hand and we walk up that holy hill hand in hand? Is there going to be some things that have to take place on the face of this earth? 
Yeah, God's got some things that he's going to have to take care of on the face of this earth. This is his fight. It's his battle. But we are just soldiers within his army. We are just obedient, doing the things of God and preparing ourselves so that we can walk hand in hand with him first of all. So that we can rule and reign on the face of this earth with Yeshua when he returns back to the face of this earth. But when that family comes back together, when the family comes back together, it's going to be a great time. They will realize they may have missed him the first time, but they're not going to miss him the second time. But they will know upon the one whom that they originally pierced. And thank goodness that he's coming back a second time. They can jump into that wave. It's great things that God's got planned for the face of this earth. It's a great game plan. Can we explain it all? No, God only reveals portions and portions and portions according to His Word and according to our understanding and according to our growth within what He's doing. But again, it's always preparing ourselves, isn't it? I'm not saying you're not. Just continue down the road of preparation. Make sure that not, we're not out here slaughtering each other and make sure when things happen that we're not slaughtering each other. Make sure that we don't get stuck in a certain way and say we're not changing from that. Because that's not what God has ever done. He's never sat stagnant. He's always moved. He's always moved. He's always pushed the tent pegs out. How do you think the testimony of Jesus Christ got spread across the face of the earth? It wasn't because Jesus Christ Himself did it. It's because things expanded with the twelve and when he left, they were commissioned to go out. To go out into all the world and preach the gospel. And God saw that it was good. And he took it around the face of the earth, didn't he? When God sees that things are good and what you're doing is right, he will take it and he will expand and he will expand upon it. And what's going on now? We're supposed to be bringing out the things of the covenant and expressing that all around the face of the earth on what God truly wants for His people and what it's going to take to be successful in these end times. It's going to take the covenant and it's going to take the testimony of Jesus Christ. So says the Scripture in Revelation, in the hardest of hard times that this earth has ever had, beyond the days of Noah, beyond the days of Cain and Abel, when there was only a few of them walking the face of the earth, things are going to get tough, but not for you and I we will be able to walk through the fire and come out on the other side of it purified. We'll be able to walk through situations and come out glowing because we have the Father with us like Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego. They were sitting in there having a party and didn't even know what was going on. And there was what? We put three guys in, there's four. Who's the fourth? Yeah. That's the one that we hold hands with. That's the ones that we walk with. And that's the ones that we've got to keep promoting and promoting and promoting. Don't be shy to open your mouth, people. Don't be shy to get out there. It's your job. It's your obligation. It's your commission. And it's the commandment of the Father. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before You and we thank You, Father, for Your Word. We thank You for Your Scripture. And right now, Father, we just come before You. Ask You to forgive us, Father. For those who want forgiveness, just ask us for, we ask for forgiveness, Father. For the things that we've, we've said, the way we may have murdered other people in the Spirit, we repent of it. In Yeshua's name, clean us, make us whole, and fill that void, Father, with your word. Fill that void with your word within our lives. In Yeshua's name we pray. Thank you for comforting and wrapping your arms around us, Father. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.